Hello, assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the concluding session on tax reforms and amnesty package in Pakistan. Um, I would like to thank you all for taking time out on a working day and on Friday afternoon. It shows the massive interest our fraternity has on these practical oriented topics. Um, for those of you who missed the session yesterday, uh, we did cover the tax reforms because there is a common perception uh, more focus has been on the amnesty aspect and many people uh, tend to overlook that there has been a tax reform package. The recording would be available online on ACC's channels, so I would not be repeating that. Uh, the presentation would be shared with you after the session. Uh, the ordinances are the same that were shared with you yesterday. So we're going to start now. Um, just one thing, uh, you sent me another presentation today. So that presentation has been this uploaded. One, it's been updated. It has been updated and has been updated on the webinar as well. So if they download it now, uh, they will be able to download the fresh. Uh, Fantastic. So in the handout section, you have the updated presentation at number four, as well as the four relevant ordinances. And you can simply download them now. Thank you, Aram, sir. And one more thing, if you can introduce your uh, team members today as well, the panelists. Hi. Rabash Rali Sadri Vayas Sevi Amri Vahalu Kati Milesani Yafka Hukali. Oh Allah, open my heart and ease my task on me and remove the impediments from my speech so that they may understand what I say. Uh, today we have created a unique pattern for you. Uh, I'll begin by introducing uh, some of our guest panelists as well as myself for those of you who are not aware of ourselves. Um, the pattern today would be that after covering the ordinances in between, we'll be taking regular question answer breaks where we'll be inviting uh, some of our fellow members who are also part of our taxation committee, which I honored to have worked uh, with the brilliant likes of these in my capacity as the chairman of the committee. Uh, right now, uh, we do have with us uh, Mr. Okay. We have Mr. Munir Malik, one of our senior members in FCCA, um, who is based in Islamabad, and he's been working actively on the taxation subcommittee of ACCA's MNP. We also have with us uh, Yawar Muhammad, who is based out of Peshawar, also another very talented and senior ACCA member. Uh, he's also on our uh, ACCA taxation committee. We welcome you both, uh, Munir and Yawar. Thank you for joining us. And uh, they'll be contributing with us in this session today in the question answer session. So with that, let's start. Uh, most of you would already know me for those who don't. Uh, just a quick uh, intro. I'm an FCCA and also honored to hold qualifications such as CFA, anti-money laundering, fraud prevention, specialization, et cetera, et cetera, along with 15 years plus fund of experience case in top positions working both in Pakistan as well as abroad. Honored to have received the Exceptional Public Value Awards and National Advocacy Awards by ACCA. I'm a member of the Global Tax Forum and chairing ACCA's Taxation Committee as well. Um, well, I um, have extensive experience as a top taxation expert, currently serving as a managing partner corporate services at Millennium Law and Corporate Company and also sit on the board of some corporate entities. Uh, with regard to training, I'm honored to have on my portfolio having conducted mandatory promotional trainings of government officers at MPDD and uh, having conducted programs at various corporate, public sector, educational entities, etc. The likes of National Bank, Habib Bank, um, Lahore Chamber, Karachi Chamber, Pakistan, Lahore, Karachi Tax Bar, our very own ACCA. Barrier, UAT, etc. For those of you who like to read, I'm a regular contributor on these technical issues in various English language dailies outlined here, ranging from Nation Time, Pakistan Today, Express Tribune to research journals such as Blue Chip. Uh, also, a life member and four time serving chairman, Lysen Committee, Lahore Tax Bar, member of the MNP, and have served on the Finance, Economy, and Taxation Committee of Lahore Chamber, advisor to several parliamentarians on taxation economic affairs and also sit on the board of a few think tanks. That's pretty much about me. I'll skip the next few slides uh, which just detail the key association and listing of academic professional associations. 
Uh, just a quick professional acknowledgement that several research reports and obviously the formal copies of the ordinances have been used and thanks to State Bank of Pakistan, National Bank Finance Ministry, uh, some financial institutions and our own firms whose proprietary research has been used in this. Uh, the topic is uh, such that we can extend it as much as we want. However, ACCI had designed the topic so that all the vital elements would be covered within the time period that we have and we'll try to meet that within the time constraint. So, topic index, we have uh, gone through the introduction and highlights. We have discussed in detail um, the uh, text reforms that, we, that have been made, their impact, etc. We have gone through one of the major ordinance, the local declaration of domestic assets ordinance, and we were moving on to foreign assets declaration and repatriation ordinance, which is the other major ordinance. We'll finish that and then we'll, uh, in the last session, go with the economic reform amendment and income tax amendment ordinance, which are uh, not that bulky. So we should be able to run through them fairly quickly. Uh, Q&A session has been listed separately, but as you know, we'll be having regular Q&A session after the end of each topic. So these things were already discussed yesterday. You can download the presentation. Uh, we discussed the impact of various uh, moves that have been made with regard to improving the tech structures and the reforms, the amnesty. So let's begin with the Foreign Assets Declaration and Repatriation Ordinance 2018. Yesterday, we went through the ordinance for the domestic assets and we saw how they were defined, what were the prohibitions, what were the limitations, what were the applicability, what were the specific rates for certain categorizations and how the assets were to be categorized. We also went through the process of claiming uh, amnesty for the domestic assets. Now we are going to do that for the foreign assets. So in your hands out section, if you click on number two, ordinance foreign assets dot PDF, you'll have this in front of you. Okay. I hope you can all read this. So if you can just quickly let me know that this is readable for all of you. Just a quick response. Okay, so I believe everyone can see this. Great, let's move forward. So this is the ordinance with regard to the foreign assets that we have been referring to yesterday. Let's start with this. So we have the normal legal jargon in the beginning, the introduction of the ordinance under clause one, article 89 of the constitution, the reference to that under which the ordinance has been promulgated. Then we have the title and commencement date and then we have the definitions. These are important from a legal perspective because you may have a certain uh, concept of a particular term in your mind, but it may be that that's the very definition that's been used here, but it may be that that's somewhat different from this definition. So it doesn't matter what impression you have in your mind. The definition that's written here is the one that would prevail. So first of all, the co cost of acquisition of the mortgage assets mean the sum of all the mortgage payments that have been made and any other mortgage cost with regard to the acquisition of the asset. The declarant means the person who is making a declaration under section five. Fair market value, we all have the concept of that. It means the price of the foreign assets determined and declared by the declarant himself, but in no case, is less than the cost of acquisition of the foreign assets. So effectively, the fair market value can only be the higher of the value you are declaring or your cost of acquisition, it can't be below that. But this is interesting that you, the declarant, by you I mean someone availing the amnesty, 
is the one who has to determine the fair market value and there is no reference to any procedure challenging that. Uh, do keep this point in mind because this is very important and we'll be coming back to this during our discussion. Foreign assets mean any movable or immovable assets held outside Pakistan. Obviously that would include all the real estate, mortgage assets, stock, share, bank accounts, any bullions, uh, cash, jewels, painting accounts, loan receivable, beneficial ownership, beneficial interest, or contribution in offshore entities and trusts. Government security, we all know, but let's go through the definition anyway. A bond, note, or other debt instrument issued by the federal government with a promise of repayment upon maturity. Liquid assets mean, you all know that you're a qualified accountant. Uh, cash or an asset that can be readily converted into cash with a minimal impact on the assets values and includes not just bank notes, but also marketable securities, stocks, promissory note, government bond, deposit certificates, and any other similar instruments. Holder of public office, why this definition is important? Because you'll be seeing in the applicability section that holders of public office, their dependents and spouses are excluded from the terms of the entire amnesty and with regard to this particular ordinance, it's embedded. Holder of public office means a person who is or has been at any time since 1st of January 2000 holding any of these offices. This is pretty standard, just like what we read in the domestic assets ordinance yesterday. So it covers the federal government uh, all the way from president, prime minister, to the cabinet, ministers, advisors, to the provincial government, chief ministers, speakers, uh, provincial ministers, advocate generals, etc., the judiciary, chief justice, justices of federal Sharia court, high court, judicial officer, or anyone holding an office or post in the service of Pakistan or any service in connection with the affairs of the federation. So, um, obviously, uh, we have discussed this yesterday. It would also cover your local government your local government, like uh, the chairman, mayor, or vice chairman, uh, deputy mayor of Silla Council, municipal committee, etc., etc. This brings us to clause number three. There has been a discussion that uh, what if there are certain other laws which are con in conflict with this ordinance? Uh, is this ordinance really providing? Uh, blanket protection or are there some loopholes the way this works is the law ministry when enacting any law be it through uh, the process of enacting an ordinance or going through the route of act do make sure that they cover all the loopholes like we had four ordinance two of them were new focusing on uh, this one the foreign assets that we are covering today and the one we covered yesterday uh, focusing on the domestic assets plus two amendment ordinances which amended the existing laws, the Economic Reform Act 1992 and the Income Tax Ordinance of 2001. So they pretty much tried to make sure that everything is covered, but because there is always a chance of a human error, a possibility something might be left out or somebody might bring something up later on, which was not so evident during the process. So the standard terminology is included that the provision of this section shall have effect notwithstanding anything to the contrary contained in any other law for the time being in force. In plain, simple English, this overrides everything else. So application, the provision of this ordinance shall apply to all citizens of Pakistan, wherever they may be, except holders of public office, their spouses and dependent children. Now, this is very interesting. Why? I did discuss this point yesterday. Uh, for those of you just joining in today, I'll just briefly touch upon that. This means that all politically exposed person, the term being referring to the public office holders, their spouses and children, basically the dependents and close relatives, they are excluded within the uh, embed of this ordinance and amnesty. So yes, they cannot take benefit of this legally, fair enough, but they can also not be penalized under this ordinance because this is a provisional clause. They are excluded from the ambit of this. So on one hand, they can't take the advantage, but on the other hand, they can't be penalized or required to do what uh, all the other citizens of Pakistan 
uh, availing this would be required to, for example, uh, filing the statement of assets you have held abroad or filing details of uh, um, income you have earned abroad, even if that's not connected to Pakistan or not being repatriated. So those provisions would certainly not be applicable to politically exposed persons. Secondly, obviously, uh, this is in connection with the foreign assets and foreign income. So the applicability of this ordinance is on all foreign assets held by the persons first mentioned in clause A, which we have already covered, and tax paid on the value of such assets under section 8, except where proceedings are pending in any court of law in respect of the foreign assets. So if you have a case in a court of law, maybe you are in litigation with the FPR vis a vis some foreign assets. So in that instance, you cannot avail this amnesty. What's the way, Sir Mar, I want to do that? Well, there is one way. Reach some kind of an agreement, withdraw your case. But the question is, if the case is in your favor, you would not want to withdraw that, right? And if the case is in FBR's favor, FBR would not want to withdraw that. So practically, it would be pretty tough. But if you are able to do that, that's the way. Uh, you can't avail the amnesty as long as the matter is subjudice. Subjudice means the term referring to matter under judicial review. The provisions of this ordinance shall not apply to any proceeds or assets that are involved in or derived from the commission of a criminal offense. Now, uh, this is an important clause because it uh, ensures that the Anti-Money Laundering Act 2010 is uh, still being upheld and the requirements and obligations of Pakistan as a sovereign state with regard to combating the terrorism, uh, the illicit monies, their financing, they are being addressed. So it's been made clear within this ordinance that any illegal monies cannot be used under the uh, pretext or under the umbrella of this amnesty. Number five, declaration and repatriation of assets held outside Pakistan. So subject to the provisions of this ordinance, a person may make to the Federal Board of Revenue by the date specified in Section 6, which is 30th of June 2018. Uh, I can quickly show you that. So Section 6 is period of applicability. The declaration and repatriation under Section 5 shall be made on or after 10th of April 2018 but on or before 30th day of June 2018. So basically this is a window of two months and uh, 21 days. So a declaration can be made to FPR in respect of the foreign assets acquired before commencement of this ordinance. So another interesting point for you to observe, and this is actually in consistency what we saw yesterday with regard to domestic assets, that you can claim amnesty with regard to the assets that were held before the promulgation of this ordinance, which is up till 9th of April 2018. The value of a foreign asset shall be fair market value as defined in section 2. And do you remember what was in section 2? The value that the declarant is declaring would be presumed to be the fair market. The declaration of the value and tax paid in respect of the foreign assets shall be in a manner as set out in form A of the schedule to this ordinance. Let's quickly go to schedule because it would make more sense if we are going through the things and connecting them rather than waiting for the relevant sections. So this is schedule A. It's quite similar to the form we saw for the domestic assets. And this is available basically online on FPR's website. Maybe later on, we'll do a small session uh, to show you how this would be actually done on the FPR's website. But basically, this is the form. Um, a declarant would have to give in their personal info, full name, CNIC, if they have NT and contact details. And then they have to fill the amount in rupees and the applicable tax for the assets they are declaring. In foreign assets, we have these four categories, liquid assets, which are not repatriated to Pakistan. They would be taxed at 5%. Immovable assets held outside Pakistan, 3%. Liquid assets repatriated and invested in government securities would only be taxed at 2%. And liquid assets 
which are repatriated, even if they are not invested in government securities, would also be taxed at just 2%. So uh, you just give a gross total and you attach the evidence of the tax paid, uh, the bank chalan, basically the CPR, computerized payment receipt with this, and you are pretty much done. In the form B, you just have to give a description of the assets, foreign assets you are declaring. If it's a foreign currency bank account, you provide the details. Then um, if there are any other assets, other liquid assets such as security, stocks, promissory notes, government bonds, DCs, deposit certificates, or other similar investments, you provide their details, any movable property, you provide their address size and the jurisdiction, Switzerland, USA, UK, whatever it is. And in the end, you sign this oath, the verification that uh, it's pretty standard terminology. You are basically uh, confirming on oath that everything that you have stated is true to the best of your knowledge and belief, and you have not concealed anything therein. And you simply sign that, submit that to the FPR, done. You are legal. All the money would be wiped then. So let's go back to where we left from section five. Okay. So the description of the foreign assets declared under subsection one and three shall be in the manner as set out in the form B, which we have already seen, and I believe you should be comfortable with. A person declaring foreign assets under subsection one may by the due date as specified in the very next section six also repatriate the set foreign assets in Pakistan. The declaration of foreign assets shall be made in the manner as set out in form A of the schedule to this ordinance. You may have to tell you that electronically it's available on FPR's uh, revenue portal and it could only be valid if accompanied by the evidence of tax payment. Uh, we have discussed the period of applicability, 10th of April 2018 to 30th June 2018, and the charge of tax. The four categories, uh, you are familiar with them by now. We just saw that in the declaration forms. But anyway, a quick review of Section 7. If the liquid assets are not repatriated to Pakistan, you have to pay a tax at 5%. Immovable assets outside Pakistan, 3%. Liquid assets repatriated to Pakistan. And either they are or not invested in government securities, 2%. But this is actually a very uh, attractive uh, option for some people. Uh, it would certainly depend on your circumstances that you would be able to invest that in five year US uh, dollar denominated government bonds with buy and will profits twice a year and a rate of return of 3%. And let me tell you, these bonds are very hard to get. Not every investor is able to get their hands on them. So as part of the deal, you'll be able to get that should you want to. Obviously, if you have more attractive investment opportunities, perhaps you may not like to. Section 8, deal with the payment of uh, tax. The due date for the payment of tax shall be the date on which the declaration is made. It's pretty standard and common sense. And this is very important. Section 8, subsection 2. No tax shall be payable by the declarant under any law for the time being in force, including the income tax ordinance 2001, where tax has been paid under subsection 1 in respect of the foreign assets declared under section 5. So one of the most common questions, will I have to pay tax on this later on? On this amount? No. In future, whatever you are, certainly. So if you think about it, uh, it is a pretty attractive deal, uh, depending on the individual circumstances. I mean, someone might have paid in Texas the, in the range of 25 to 35%, and you are able to whiten your money uh, for uh, rates between 2 to 5%. So from their perspective, it's a very attractive scheme. And yesterday I did mention that Pakistan is not the only or the first country to launch such a scheme. Although um, the timing uh, is quite interesting. However, Malaysia, Indonesia, India have launched such schemes, uh, some of which uh, have been um, quite a success, especially the one in Indonesia. Um, they did accompany that with some structural reforms in their taxation operators and uh, by running drives to induce confidence in the target segment 
So perhaps these are the things which should be considered uh, with regard to this as well, because this amnesty is not just important for Pakistan. Pakistani diaspora is based all over the world. Plus, you have to also think ahead in line with ACCA's um, strategy and think of the possible ramifications with regard to CPEC as well. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some time at the end of the session and we'll cover that in a bit too. Section 9, currency and the rate of conversion. This is very important. The value of the foreign asset under subsection 2 of section 5 shall be in rupees. So the value you are declaring will have to be in rupees. The tax payable under section 8 shall be paid in the US dollars as specified in form A of the schedule to the ordinance. So that brings us to the interesting question. What would be the applicable conversion rate? Well, it should be pretty obvious to you being the qualified accountants, the value in rupees under subsection one shall be converted to the US dollars at the State Bank of Pakistan's rate applying between the US dollar and the rupee on the date the declaration is made under section six and the tax is paid under section eight. In plain English, on the date you make the declaration, state banks, US dollar to park rupee rate would be used as the conversion rate. Nice sentence, nothing complicated. The mode and manner, the SPP shall notify the mode and the manner of the repatriation of liquid assets in Pakistan. Deposit of tax in US dollars in state bank of pakistan and the deposit of tax in rupees in the income tax account of the federal consolidated fund incorporation in the book of accounts uh, well where the declarant has paid the tax under section 8 and made a declaration under section 5 they would be entitled to incorporate this in the book of accounts uh, any such foreign assets. So basically what it's simply saying is that all these foreign assets would now be legitimate and you would be able to incorporate them um, within your accounts, within your income tax return and anything, any records you may have to prepare for yourself or for the government bodies henceforth. Henceforth be referring to the date when you make the declaration. For the purposes of the income tax ordinance 2001, the cost of acquisition of foreign assets and the date of acquisition shall be deemed to be cost of acquisition, the value you declare. Date of acquisition, the date you declare. Again, nice and easy. Nothing complicated there. Section 12 is interesting and 13, uh, 13 is very interesting. We'll be paying more attention to that. Investment in government securities under serial number 3 of the table in section 7 shall be made in accordance with the scheme to be introduced by the government of Pakistan through the State Bank of Pakistan by notification in the official gazette specifying the periodic rate of return and the period for the rate of return and period of maturity. It's basically standard terminology giving State Bank the right to govern this investment area because normally this is State Bank's domain. These government securities are governed and run by them. Confidentiality. Now, this should dispel uh, the apprehensions of many businesses. Um, I was actually discussing with uh, some of the key businessmen in the chamber this morning that how are you viewing this uh, amnesty scheme? And what I realized was that there was a huge, tremendous lack of information. And there are serious misunderstandings. Uh, people certainly uh, businesses doesn't know businessmen hardly do that it was obvious they haven't read the ordinance but what was more surprising it seemed like their financial teams haven't either because they were coming up with ideas like uh, maybe we would be text again my accountant thing after the amnesty I would be text again so I told them no sir you won't be unless the law is changed or struck down by the court now that's an interesting question which will lead to the question answer session that uh, what can happen legally and how would the people availing this amnesty as of now would stand should they were to avail this right now. 
With regard to clause 13, confidentiality, notwithstanding the provisions of section 3 of section, uh, subsection 3 of section 216 of ITO 2001 income tax ordinance, the right of access to Information Act 2017, and other laws for the timing in force particulars of any person making a declaration under this ordinance or information received uh, in any declaration made under this ordinance shall be confidential. First thing, any declaration you make under this ordinance would be confidential. Period. Subsection 2 of Section 13. This is more interesting. Anyone who discloses the particular shall commit an offense punishable on conviction with a fine between 500,000 to 1 million or imprisonment for a term of up to one year or both. So it's as much security as possibly can be provided. You are declaring a value, nobody is questioning that. Uh, you just pay the minimal rates, it's fine. Then uh, your information is confidential, it can't be shared. If somebody leaks that information, share that, they'll be committing an offense, seriously punishable, heavily in monetary terms, even with the jail imprisonment or even both. So it sounds like a pretty good blanket coverage. Uh, perhaps the only thing that need to be done is uh, some reforms with regard to taxation and creating more awareness on the pattern of Indonesia to make this a success. Declaration not admissible in evidence. This is even further more strengthening the protection provided under this ordinance to the potential declarants that notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the timing in force, nothing contained in any declaration made under section five under this ordinance shall be admissible in evidence against the declarant. So basically, whatever you are submitting under this ordinance cannot be legally held as a proof in any proceedings against you. So how's that? What more protection can there be? Removal of difficulty, if any difficulties arises in giving effect to the provision of this ordinance, then the federal government is empowered to make such order in writing as is not inconsistent with the other provisions of this ordinance in order to remove such difficulty. Last but not the least, if you make any misrepresentation under this ordinance in a declaration, that should, shall be deemed null and void and deemed to never have been made under this ordinance. So if it can be proved that somebody made a misdeclaration, uh, they lied, they misrepresented, then that's null and void. But the question would be, what mechanism can make that happen? So with that question in your mind, I'll go to our panelists for the question answers session. And can you please type your questions? Any questions that you may have, uh, feel, feel free to answer, uh, feel free to ask any questions that you have. And we have with us, Mr. Munir Malik and Mr. Jawar Muhammad. Munir and Jawar, can you please unmute yourselves? Thank you. Munir and Jawar. So we have first question from Hadi Ajaz. When investing in government securities, there should be some more favor in rate. Well, it's a comment, but uh, very quickly, Hadi, you'll be getting 3% extra return. Isn't that a favor? <laughs> I think you need to give them no, a ping. No, that's all right. And we had muted them, but you clicked it. Oh, yeah. Double click. Okay, um, Munir Saab and Yawar Saab, do we have you with us? Uh, yeah. Yes. 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 Great. Okay, uh, Munir Saab, unfortunately, need to leave shortly. So in this Q&A session, we'll be directing the questions to Munir Saab. And then in the next session, we'll be directing the questions to Yawar. Um, okay, the first question we have for you, Munir Saab, is by Ijaz Mazhar Saab. He's asking, 
in your opinion, is that fair to not to apply this ordinance to public office holders in perspective of them not declaring their assets either domestic or foreign? Um, Basically, he is asking uh, the point that we referred that when these uh, politically exposed persons are provided a provisio and they are excluded. So uh, Mr. Ajaz is asking, shouldn't they have been included at least in the requirements section to file their declaration? What's your perspective? Uh, the, the basic reason for not being the part of this ordinance is that the, uh, the political ex exposed people are currently under investigations uh, and held by different federal authorities including national accountability bureau as well uh, so the uh, perception is that they will get the benefit out of it and they just introduce the amnesty for themselves uh, I, i'll need to stop you Munir. let me rephrase the question what uh, ijaz is asking is different i mean this is a common question you answered but he's asking shouldn't they have been required that you have to file a declaration of the assets you hold domestically and foreign any foreign asset without them still not having this opportunity without them having the right to avail this is just asking shouldn't this have been tighter for the politically exposed person that on one hand they shouldn't have been able to take the advantage as of right now but they should have been required to file their foreign and domestic assets and undeclared income uh, my answer should be yes uh, everyone uh, should do that and including those political exposed persons as well great thank you uh, i would just add here uh, ijaz uh, munisab has supported your perspective and he said yes they should have been included well, actually, there are already provisions in the or income tax ordinance which requires them to do that. So with regard to this ordinance, it's basically providing a way and you have the benefit and then you have the associated liability. So with regard to them being required to file those returns, the law is already in existence. It's only a question of enforcing that law. The next question we have is from Mr. Hamid Khan. Hi, can you please share some regional country schemes? Uh, I think we have answered that, Munisa. We referred to Indonesia, Malaysia, India. Uh, next one is from Muhammad Ali Shinwari. Why will someone disclose its hidden asset, either domestic or foreign, to government? Munisa. Uh, the actual purpose of this amnesty is to uh, get a one time uh, benefit out of it and just pay. A, a nominal amount of tax of five percent. So, uh, if you don't uh, and unable to disclose it in the past, it is a good opportunity to bring those assets and bring your uh, money white and legal as per the requirement of the laws in in Pakistan. So, uh, that's an opportunity for them to do that. Okay. So Munisa is saying because it's an attractive opportunity for them to whiten their money and um, just um, basically remove any irregularities that exist at a very nominal cost. Next, we have uh, Shabazz Makhdoum asking, why is the tax to be paid in US dollars when our currency is Pak Rupi? Munisa, uh, why you are getting the tax in Pak Rupi, uh, in US dollar? The national currency in Pak Rupi is Pak Rupi. Why are you getting it in dollars? Yeah, the, the mode and the manner of payment as per the uh, section 10 of this, this ordinance categorically explains that the deposit of tax in rupee in the income tax account of the federal consolidated fund. Only for those in dollars in the State Bank of Pakistan, when you uh, bring that money from Outside Pakistan, it comes into the State Bank of Pakistan's dollar account, then it converted at the rate of the State Bank of Pakistan uh, to your rupee account. So the benefit is given to put that investment into the US dominated dollars bonds. Otherwise, you are absolutely right. It should be in Pakistani rupees, and it, it is as per the section 10 of the, this ordinance. 
but for those who want to invest in the um, US dominated uh, denominated bonds only for those did they have to be uh, US dollars okay so Munis sahab has just shared his perspective on this uh, well i would add that uh, the entire reason for this amnesty one of the largest uh, justification was that pakistan is currently facing a serious current account deficit in addition to the fiscal deficit and uh, pakistan's foreign account reserves foreign currency reserves currently stand at 11.3 or 4 billion dollars and with some major repayments uh, if uh, we do not get the necessary inflows then they can as per imf and certain monetary institution fall to 9.3 to 9.5 billion which would be very critical come june so one of the key aim was to shore up the reserves as well so by having the tax in us dollar this is basically in line with that aim that you would be getting us dollars with regard to park rupee the state bank can print that yes there would be problem there would be higher inflation the rupee would be devalued etc but they have the authority to value the, uh, to print that with regard to dollars there are basically a few ways you can get that borrow the dollars increase your export so you get more dollars or that there is uh, repatriation of dollars in the country foreign exchanges coming into the country so this basically fall in the third perspective uh munisab shabaz mehtoom sahab has also asked from you what is the benefit of investing in government bonds when in fourth row of the form a it says foreign assets repatriated in pakistan will also be taxed at two percent so he's saying if i just repatriate my assets in pakistan without investing i'll still be taxed at two percent why should I even consider investing in government bonds? Is there any rational? Is it attractive? Absolutely. Uh, as rightly mentioned by you during the presentation, those bonds currently have access only to uh, some uh, highly selective investors and uh, most of the people around the world have no access to those. So if you uh, be being the part of that credit club, uh, it would, would be an opportunity to be part of that. and. Um, on top of that, you will get an additional rate of return on those bonds, uh, which will make and cover the taxes paid by you here in Pakistan at the rate of 2%. So at net, you will gain out of it. Very well elaborated. Thank you, Munisa. Next one is Muhammad Ali Shinwari asking, will this be continued irrespective of a change in government? Now you got a bouncer, Munir. <laughs> <laughs> Answer that. <laughs> Yeah, um, actually, before the change of government, uh, this ordinance has to go through the eyes of the court of the law because there are uh, some applicants who already filed the petition challenging the this ordinance in the courts in, in Pakistan. So uh, before the change of government, <laughs> we have to face it. And this is quite unfortunately that uh, in Pakistan, the things have changed with the government. The consistency in, in policy is a thing which ACC always advocates and advocates in the past as well. Great, thank you. Uh, just a quick addition here that uh, although uh, you can't really comment on any subjudice matter, but the trend and the precedents have been that normally policies which have benefit people, if they are deemed illegal, they are stopped henceforth. It is very rare and extremely, extremely um, technical for a court of law to declare any national scheme or amnesty such as these uh, as void ab an issue. You can't really 100% be sure because at the end of the day, a judge has to decide the matter. But the past trend and the precedents are such that normally it's done henceforth, which means that anyone who has availed it till now would still have the benefit. The case in point, if you do remember in uh, the era before the last government, there was an amnesty scheme with regard to customs and cars, and then that was challenged in the court. And then the final outcome was that the people who have availed were, got the benefit, but it was stopped henceforth. So just uh, a point to give some confidence to the people concerned about this. Next one is from Taslim Faraz. Who will ensure that politician and holders of public office get the benefit or not? 
so basically the same is asking munir that how would someone know that a person who is declaring under this ordinance is not a politically exposed person especially when their information cannot be shared uh, it's a criminal offense to make that information public there is a confidentiality clause and there is no clear cut public information about any potential criteria to vet the applicants obviously uh, the confidentiality clause was added to give the protection to the people so that the information should not be made public and comes into the media as well but yes you are absolutely right the checks are only available with the government and they have the checks to make sure that those person uh, should not avail that amnesty scheme thank you if finally is asking when you are not asking the source of income then how you can assure yourself that the money earned is not from any illegal activity well he actually elaborated it from any drug related or terrorist activity so another uh, good york for you munir yeah. the questions <laughs> absolutely what's up currently in this section uh, 111 in the income tax ordinance 2001 we, we have actually seen that source of income uh, and source of funds coming in pakistan is, is not being investigated as well so uh, that scheme is not different from the current income tax ordinance appearing as well but this is giving a one time opportunity to make the money wide so uh, mm -hmm. yes you are absolutely right the source uh, uh, is always being questioned not under this scheme but in the ordinance as well okay uh the next one is from mr usman yusuf asking if foreign assets are bought from foreign asset uh, foreign earned income even then does the individual need to pay the tax as foreign tax is already paid on while earning these income does it not result in double taxation okay uh munir he is asking that if somebody has been earning a foreign source income nothing to do with pakistan paid their due taxes uh, would they also need to declare those assets here and pay this tax if they do then wouldn't that be double taxation um if the person who earns the foreign income and paid the foreign tax um ideally they should declare those assets in the well statement in the past but if they missed out they can declare it in the upcoming statements and uh, make sure that they have the evidence available for all the taxes paid okay thank you and don't you think pps uh, from declaration may reduce the confidence of declarer excluding uh, shabaz makdum is asking don't you think that excluding politically exposed persons from declaration may reduce the confidence of ordinary declarants in the scheme actually the, this will strengthen their confidence because uh, the perception is that the scheme is uh, being launched in the past for only to make uh, make sure that the politician get the benefit out of it so this is the first time the scheme is being directed to the only the businessman and not the politicians so shabaz on the contrary it should serve to increase the confidence uh, babar Patrick is asking, do you have any insights into FPR's assessment vis-a-vis -vis the potential revenue generation from this scheme? Uh, yes, as rightly mentioned by the Omar Saab in, in one of the question answer that Pakistan is in a serious trade deficit at the moment and balance of payments. So this scheme uh, has helped uh, the other regional countries like um, Malaysia, Indonesia, and India. If the scheme becomes successful, it will definitely help Pakistan as well. Great. Uh, do you have any figure, any uh, thing you have heard, what they are aiming for, how many billions? Um, as per the study of the different professional firms from over the years, the Pakistanis have more than hundred billion dollars. Uh, outside pakistan in the form of the money which is not legally declared in the tax uh, statements in pakistan so if that out of that 100 billion some billions come in here it will definitely help the country great fantastic shahzaman is asking why the rate is so low what are the chances of the success of this scheme 
actually uh, you just need to uh, see, see the uh, background around the scheme um, not only in pakistan but around the world there's a crackdown going on on the illegal money so that's the benefit pakistan authorities want to take because if uh, we would not be able to offer the amnesty to to them maybe the money would not be uh, come back to pakistan and maybe uh, <laughs> and tap somewhere in the bank accounts outside mm -hmm. Pakistan. So uh, make the uh, tax rate low is to just to attract them so that they can bring them in Pakistan. And from point forward, that money will help us. Great. Uh, Adil Nasser is asking, what will be the double entry for incorporating domestic or foreign assets in the book of accounts? So back to the school for you, Munir. The yeah. double entry. <laughs> it would be basically you are declaring your assets definitely in the wealth statement but over on the other side you have that luxury to not to disclose as an income be the part of the income tax ordinance for the first um, and that's the difficult part for an accountant to dissolve it mm. Well, I think uh, one entry could be, for example, uh, with regard to businesses, it could be you debit the assets that have been declared and just credit them straight away into capital. So you have just bought that into the capital and similar strategies can be used for individual. So that would serve the purpose. It would still hide the source if somebody doesn't want to declare that and balance the workbooks. You know, we accountants are actually, in fact, finance professionals is the term we use. We are very creative. We always find a way. <laughs> okay, next up, uh, Muhammad Ali Shinwari is asking, uh, Shivani, in fact, sorry, uh, which class of people will be self willing to disclose those assets to government on which they are not currently paying any taxes? Ali, I think Munisab has answered that already that anybody who has undeclared wealth has this chance to remove the illegality at very low rates. So it should attract them, should sufficient confidence be used in the scheme. is asking with regards to the annual tax filing, would the individual need to disclose the tax return? Um, no, the, uh, as mentioned, ordinance as well. Uh, any information disclosed here is not been the part of the income tax ordinance and do not need to disclose that in your income tax ordinance and the paid, and the paid tax again. True. Plus, the return is to be released around June, August or September, likely in September. So that's the pattern. By that time, all the things would have been finalized. 30th June would have gone. And one would believe that, uh, as you have also rightly pointed out, in the wealth statement, there would be some uh, additional uh, columns to declare the assets that have been uh, announced, declared under this amnesty, uh, which shouldn't really impact the tax calculation, just a declaration so that it can be included henceforth. So, yeah, that's great. Uh, Ijaz Mazhar is also asking that other than Form A, which is believed to be filed before tax return. So that's part of that question you have answered. Babar Hatak is asking, what alternatives FPR is likely to put in place if the scheme in question does not generate the desired results? So basically, Babar is saying, if the scheme is not a success, what is the plan B of FPR? Uh, um, if you uh, read the budget proposal which the ACC has submitted to the FBR, we um, mentioned um, there are lots of uh, initiatives that FBR has to take to make sure that uh, the broadening of tax benefits happen in Pakistan. Uh, but obviously, uh, to tap the assets lying outside Pakistan is not easy for the FBR as well because. Um, under the income tax ordinance, we are not required to investigate for the money beyond six years. So, uh, avenues currently available with the FBR is very less and few. So, uh, Manisa, perhaps you would also like to refer here to the OECD convention, 
which Pakistan has now signed and FPR has the powers to request information from foreign authorities. That might also act as the plan B. Uh, also with regard to the proposals, our proposals you just referred. Maybe you would like to expand on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the OECD convention with Pakistan has signed and is going to affect from the 1st of January 2017. The information sharing is going on and um, FBR can take the advantage of that as well. But keeping in mind, uh, this exercise is going to take uh, lots of time and maybe years to come. And, and this is an opportunity to just have a uh, assets coming in Pakistan in just a matter of a few days. So mm -hmm. an ideal opportunity for those who want to make sure that the assets are legal and white. Legal. Thank you. Uh, Muhammad Ali is also asking, is there any minimum amount that would uh, have been waived? That is no tax, even then they were not declared before. So Ali even want a below taxable limit in this industry too. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, there is no such thing. Come on, it's just two to five percent. Uh, but the answer is no. Hadi Ajaz is asking how double taxation treaty concept affects amnesty taxation procedure. Manir sir. Yep. Um, this amnesty and uh, is solely for the purpose of those assets who have who never been declared in the well statement in the past. Under the mm -hmm. tax duty, um, the concept is that is, is to uh, avoid the taxation two times for those mm -hmm. entities who have operations in the foreign countries as well. And they are mm -hmm. declaring their assets regularly in their statements in Pakistan. So uh, we have to be distinguish these two, the double taxation impact and the this amnesty scheme. Great. Usman Yusuf is asking, what is the purpose of this amnesty scheme? If you have legal money earned to purchase foreign assets, as criminal proceeds are not eligible under this scheme, why some pay tax on white money which he fails to declare? So you need to clarify this to Usman between uh, the difference between money is gotten from illegal activities and the tax evaded money Please. yeah absolutely uh if you are particularly sure that you have uh, uh earned the money and pay the taxes on it and just fail to declare it in the next time and by in the june or maybe september you would be a, have a chance to declare those in the value statement and then you can convince the tax authority that you have paid the taxes this scheme is for those who uh, never paid taxes on the money and never declared that in the statements great johnny jory lal is asking i suppose double taxation treaty will help those person to avoid double taxation on their legitimate income which has already been taxed at foreign country yes or no for the double taxation yes but this scheme is as i mentioned earlier is different from that true irfan ali is asking what is the frequency of such amnesty schemes in different areas of the world we are introducing such schemes time and again don't you think this scheme will encourage people to hide and wait for such schemes to legalize their money yeah um, <laughs> That's the part which we need to consider uh, it because uh, we have witnessed that in the income tax ordinance, we have introduced the uh, a section on the cash withdrawal taxation from the bank accounts. We have introduced the concept of filers and non-filers. And the regional countries have done the same, but not for over the years, but for the one year only to get the data out of it and then try to tax those peoples. Um, we should, should not make this. Um, uh, make this scheme as a part of the revenue generation but this should be one of uh, initiative to make sure that the those who are unable to declare the money and unable to declare, pay the taxes should pay them at once and for point forward uh, you have the record of those people and make sure that those people being part of the income tax ordinance as well great 
Muhammad Iqbal, if new government make changes in ordinance that those who have declared their assets in the scheme will be accountable for tax evasion. Iqbal, I think this has been answered before. Uh, there are certain clauses in the constitution which prevent that, that uh, a taxpayer or a beneficiary cannot be penalized retrospectively like that. Um, if the parliament passes such a law, then there would be a big question of future confidence in the government initiatives. So uh, while there may be a chance of the scheme being stopped henceforth, whether it would be avoided ab initio or such measures would be introduced um, might not be that likely. Anyway, this has been answered before, discussed before. Usman Yusuf is saying, what is starting date from which undisclosed assets can be covered under the scheme? Yeah, it was mentioned in the ordinance as well that uh, undisclosed assets before the date of so Ijaz Mazhar is thanking uh, Salman is saying I understand that the scheme is being introduced in hopes that it will uh, counteract the deficit that we are facing one of which is IMF loan now IMF have strict anti-money laundering policies in place including those relating to terrorism financing therefore when we make payments to IMF using our revised assets newly declared are we certain that IMF will not express its reservations over such money? Manisa. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, the IMF is uh, in the past as well is the favor of the, these schemes because uh, focus is, is always on to reduce the uh, deficit in the balance of payments to make sure that Pakistan have enough money to pay for their for its bills and mm -hmm. this is, uh, will make sure that we get the uh, required foreign exchange in the country and uh, the bills which is coming in the in the uh, months ahead as mentioned by the Omar Saab very rightly uh, Pakistan is able to survive those difficult periods great thank you very much Munir Saab we do realize we have just run a bit over five and you have been very patient in answering the question. We thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Omar Saab, and thank you, ACCA, for being uh, having a nice host for this wonderful session. You're most welcome. Have a good day. Okay, guys, so let's move back to the session. How do I make this go away? Uh, Okay, so this brings us to the Economic Reforms Amendment Ordinance 2018, which basically is just a one-pager released by the State Bank of Pakistan. It's available on State Bank's website as well, should any of you want to see the original. Okay, so promulgation of the protection of economic reforms amendment ordinance 2018 has been done it says authorized dealers may find enclosed a copy of the protection of economic reforms amendment ordinance 2018 in terms of which section 5 of the protection of economic reforms act 1992 has been amended why it has been amended because this amnesty uh, basically requires certain protection vis-a-vis uh, -vis section 114 of the income tax ordinance which also ties up with the economic reform act 1992 so accordingly para 1 uh, subsection 4 uh, chapter 6 of foreign exchange manual 2017 stands revised as under foreign currency accounts can be fed by remittances received from abroad. Travelers' checks issued outside Pakistan, whether in the name of account holder or in the name of any other person, and foreign exchange generated by encashment of securities issued by the government of Pakistan. 
a foreign currency account of a res citizen of Pakistan, resident in Pakistan, can also be fed with cash foreign currency only if the account holder is a filer as defined in the Income Tax Ordinance 2001. So basically, this is one of the reforms we discussed yesterday that has been enacted by way of this amendment in the Economic Reforms Ordinance 1992. What this says in plain, simple English is, henceforth, no non-filer can operate a foreign currency account in Pakistan. All other instructions on the subject remain unchanged. All authorized dealers are advised to bring the above instructions to the notice of their constituents and ensure meticulous compliance. So while uh, if you are based in Pakistan, you are a citizen in Pakistan, resident in Pakistan, and you are getting uh, foreign currency from abroad, you might be still able to receive that in your account, but you cannot go and deposit cash in your accounts. Which brings us to the next topic, which is the Income Tax Amendment Ordinance. Which is the last of the four ordinances which we have to cover. And I think before we proceed on to this ordinance, which really should be the last topic of the day, let's have a few questions with uh, Yawarsa, who has been waiting very patiently. Uh, Yavasa, can you please uh, uh, unmute? Yeah, sure. Great. Thank you for waiting, Yavar. Uh, good to have you here today. Likewise. So the first question for you is from Shahid Khalil, sir. He's asking, can corporates avail this amnesty scheme? Can you hear me, Yavar? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Can corporates avail this amnesty scheme? Hello. Can you hear us, Yavar? I'm not Hello? getting voice. Hello. Okay. Um, Hello. All right. Can can other participants please confirm if they can hear us? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, all right. So, so something, that means with some, something wrong with Yawa's side. Okay. Hmm? Yes. Um, Yawa, it seems that there's something wrong with your uh, uh, audio equipment. So, as soon as you can uh, double check your equipment. Um, you can join us back. In the meanwhile, I think we can continue with the questions. Yeah. Um, so, Shahid Khalil, you asked, can corporates avail this amnesty scheme? Yes, they can. We saw that in the ordinances we covered. Shah Zaman is asking, Pakistan is already in gray list. And by announcing this type of scheme, are we giving the world a chance to blacklist us? Well, not really, Shah Zaman. The thing is this, legally, the ordinance protect by excluding any illegal monies. Uh, we have also discussed this point yesterday that, uh, yes, FATF may uh, be interested in knowing what actual procedures and checks are there to ensure though no illegal monies go through this apparatus. So as long as those systems are in place, it shouldn't be a cause of concern. Um, Usman Yusuf, what are the consequences of declaring assets in different periods under this scheme? That is 2014, 15, or 15, 16. Well, there is no time bar response, so you can declare assets relating to any time period. This would be a fresh start for you at very low rates. Mohammed Iqbal is saying, if new government make changes in ordinance, that those who have declared their assets in this scheme will be accountable for tax evasion. If new government make changes in ordinance, that those who have declared will be okay. Uh, he has asked one question four times. Really passionate. Okay. Um, Iqbal sir, this has been discussed repeatedly, very briefly again. Um, if the government would want to do that, it would have to ensure it passes through the parliament as an act of the parliament. But there should be serious consideration because that would decreate 
future interest in any legislation and offer by the government of Pakistan. The precedent has not been that, and even such a move can be challenged in the court of law. Uh, normally, the patronage such scheme can be uh, declared void henceforth. Uh, declaring that void of an, an issue, though still possible, is very rare and difficult. So uh, while you can't rule out any possibility, the chances are extremely, extremely slim, practically next to nil. So are you getting me? Yeah, Yavor, can you hear us now? Yes, yes, yes. Great. Sorry, Welcome I think back. some interruption has happened. I don't know. Yeah. No issue, no issue. Uh, so Yavor, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you getting me clearly? Absolutely. Fine as anything. Yes. Yeah. Muhammad Iqbal is saying if new government make changes in ordinance that those who have declared. Okay. Okay. Smart Yusuf has asked assets acquired before 10th of April, the end date. Well, Usman, that's actually the beginning date. Can be covered under the scheme. What will be the beginning date for assets purchased? to be covered under the scheme. Yavar, I think Usman is trying to ask that uh, how long can you go back under this scheme? Uh, what is the earliest think, that you can declare under this? Yeah, I think the assets, you know, if we talk about the assets, so it's about the current position, the current assets you are current holding, currently holding in your books of accounts or you have not disclosed it. So, if we talk about assets, we can't say that we have disclosed the assets in the past four years. Whatever we are holding rightly now, we have to disclose it. Maybe we have bought it 10 years ago, buy it, when we buy it. If we didn't disclose it, it means we have to disclose it now, outrightly. So, you can go back as, uh, as, back as you want. Precisely. Uh, Usman, Yavar has explained that to you and there is no bar in the ordinance so that even legally supports the answer. You can go back as much as you like to. Mohammed Zohar Chaudhary is saying, what if someone was a filer since 2010 and now wants to declare his or her assets and submit his or her updated returns? Is this amnesty equally beneficial for him or her to update their status? I believe what he's trying to say that somebody uh, uh, has been a filer since 2010 and there are two possibilities one they were under declared and now want to uh, ensure that all their wealth can be whitened another can be that they did not possibly declare all the assets they held pre-2010 so he's asking how would this amnesty be beneficial in these circumstances well uh, if we have this question we answer it then we will take it this way कि अगर एक बंदे ने असल में आई थिंक हमें यहां पे टू थिंग्स टू चीजों को साथ लेके चलना चाहिए एक डबल टैक्सेशन ट्रीटी है हमारे पास और दूसरा ये एमनेस्टी स्कीम है ठीक है अगर आपकी कोई भी इनकम जो आपके आपने अनडिक्लेयर की की है और वो डबल टैक्सेशन ट्रीटी के अंदर कवर होती है एंड यू आर नॉट रिक्वायर्ड टू पे एनी टैक्सेस तो वी हैव ऑप्शन टू रिवाइज आवर रिटर्न एज़ पर इनकम टैक्स ऑर्डिनेंस लेकिन अगर कोई ऐसी चीज है कि जिसके ऊपर हमें टैक्स पे करना चाहिए दैन वी डिडंट पे एनी टैक्सेस so उसके लिए फिर हमारे पास ये ऑप्शन है कि हम एमएनएसटी के अंदर कवर हो सकते हैं तो इट डजंट मैटर कि आप टेन से आज तक कुछ भी डिक्लेअर नहीं किया अगर वो 11 को बिलोंग कर रहा है 12 टैक्स ईयर से बिलोंग कर रहा है अगर आपने उस पे टैक्स देने हैं देन यू हैव टू अवेल द बेनिफिट्स ऑफ द एमएनएसटी एंड मीनवाइल हैज टू रिवाइज योर वेल्थ स्टेटमेंट्स और यू नो डिस्क्लोज इन द करंट वेल्थ स्टेटमेंट एंड व्हाट अबाउट द सेकंड इंस्टेंस वेयर देयर हैज बीन एन अंडर डिक्लेरेशन देयर अंडर डिक्लेरेशन आई थिंक देन यू हैव टू रिवाइज इट you have to declare it correctly on the fair market value yeah but if you declare that uh, correctly on the fair market value you would also fall within the uh, particular clauses dealing with uh, misdeclaration so perhaps this amnesty can be a better option yeah yeah i think this would be a better option great uh, next noman alisha is asking making it compulsory for every resident irrespective of his or her income level to file income tax return is the G government of Pakistan planning to differentiate between non-filer and filer while paying sales tax in future too basically we discussed uh, the reforms yesterday and one was the, the PM announced that uh, the move which has been uh, in the finance acts before uh, would actually be enforced and every CNIC holder would be required to file return so he is asking in uh, the context of that that is it uh, uh, fair to make it compulsory for every CNIC holder to file the return and whether the government is planning to even uh, introduce the filer non-filer concept in the sales tax too. 
अच्छा अगर हम इनकम टैक्स ऑर्डिनेंस को देखें तो हम जिन जिन लोगों ने रिटर्न फाइल करनी है वी हैव सेक्शन 114 फॉर दैट अगर सेक्शन 114 में फिर लाइबल टू फाइल रिटर्न देन वी हैव टू वी आर लाइबल टू फाइल रिटर्न्स उसको मैं अवॉइड नहीं कर सकते सीएनआईसी को एंटीन बना देने से हरगिज ये आपके ऊपर लाजमी नहीं हो जाएगा कि आपने रिटर्न फाइल करनी है जब तक आप सेक्शन 114 के गार्ड में फॉल नहीं कर रहे होगे सो यू हैव सीन आई सी व्हाट दे हैव अनाउंस्ड इज दैट दे आर प्लानिंग टू मेक सम चेंजेस व्हिच सर्टेनली वुड मीन दैट 114 वुड नीड टू बी अमेंडेड एज़ वेल एंड दे आर गोइंग फॉर एवरी सीएनआईसी होल्डर बीइंग रिक्वायर्ड टू फाइल अ रिटर्न इफ इफ दिस अमेंडमेंट हैज टू बी मेड इन द ऑर्डिनेंस देन दे वी हैव टू एंड दिस वुड बी लिटिल अनफेयर यस आई वुड से यस but if the amendment has been made it would have been made in the ordinance as we guess we have to file the returns lekin jo current status agar hum dekhe current status hum dekhe to we have to follow section 114 if uh, they put it there then we have no other option very true and the answer to second question yavar uh, can you repeat it please yeah whether the government is planning to introduce differential rates in sales tax too for filers and non filers ये चीज अभी तक तो सामने नहीं आई फाइलर और नॉन फाइलर के लिए सेल्स टैक्स की बात कर रहे हैं जी या अभी तक तो ये चीज सामने नहीं आई ऑल दो वी हैव द कांसेप्ट ऑफ फर्दर टैक्स हियर इफ द पर्सन इज नॉट रजिस्टर्ड तो उसको फर्दर टैक्स बिजनेस को पे करना पड़ सकता है लेकिन अगर हम कंज्यूमर की बात करें तो आई डोंट थिंक कि ये कांसेप्ट जो है वो इंट्रोड्यूस uh, किया जाएगा कभी एंड वुड बी वेरी हार्ड मीन थिंक योर लोकल कॉर्नर शॉप करियाने शॉप uh would have to buy a computer to check whether you are a filer every time you are buying grocery <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 they can't check this thing i think yeah, maybe. Uh, even if they want to do something as you rightly said that can only be done on a corporate level uh okay uh, thank you we have the next question from usman yusuf what will be the rate of tax on foreign movable assets that is vehicle under the ordinance you discuss Usman, I think we have covered that in the ordinance. Uh, rate, the rate in this instance, if you are just declaring that assets, asset not bringing that to Pakistan would be five percent. And if you liquidate that asset, bring that to Pakistan, then the rate would be two percent. Um, the next question we have is, can Mr. Yawar explain to me the eligibility to submit the return? as he mentioned as per section 114 <laughs> i think you need to see section 114 for that is a long <laughs> list and i can see things like you like it out of that list <laughs> i think i think you need to study section 114 it's a very long list so true. what can i say just download the ordinance and read it true it pretty much cover all the possibilities practically only widows uh, under age children people who are not earning anything or don't own any property are the exceptions uh, anybody else who is practically earning any income or owns certainly defined criteria of property or even if they don't do now but have submit last year's return a criteria like that have been covered uh, so yeah the best advice is it's extremely simple in plain english download it if you don't want to download it the sessions on these are on acca's ymu and youtube channel just go to the income tax uh, ordinance section uh, session or go to the filing section uh, session uh, and you'll find all the details there i think yeah you did on income tax ordinance this time right yeah 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 i've, I've covered all, all the ordinances the the recording and there is detail and there is detail available on youtube as well as on ymu great fantastic so uh, is there any more question if not then we'll move back to the ordinance that was the last question and mashallah we have answered all the questions great yes good. thank you very much yawar uh, we'll uh, just finish off the ordinance last ordinance now and then at the end of that we'll take some more questions thank you very much okay. for the time thank you so let's move back with this we have the last ordinance of the day the income tax amendment ordinance i believe you should all be able to see this comfortably and read it on your screens again the standard terminology uh, the preface that how this was enacted under which clauses 
the ordinance is called the Income Tax Amendment Ordinance 2018, and it came into force at once, which was 10th of April. Amendment of the ordinance in the Income Tax Ordinance 2001 in Section 111, just like I mentioned to you that all these things are tied up. With regard to amnesty, it was vital that uh, an amendment in Section 111 be made. However, the government also introduced a certain reform for which it was very important to introduce certain amendments uh, in the Income Tax Ordinance. One of the key reforms that was introduced was, and ACCA take pride in that, that ACCA was the flag bearer of introducing the concept for that reform is, uh, as you'll see in this section, the government has amended the infamous section 1114 so that people can now bring money up to $100,000, no question asked, no tax, but for big fishes, anything above $100,000, still the foreign exchange is important for the country, no tax, but the source would be asked. So effectively, trying to implement this in a phased manner to curb the misuse of this provision while trying to still retain the benefit vis-a-vis -vis the foreign accounts, um, the foreign currency, foreign exchange we receive, and to tackle the current account deficit. So let's go through this. In section triple one for subsection two, the following shall be substituted, namely, two, the amount referred to in subsection one shall be included in the person's income chargeable to tax in the tax year to which such amount relates if the amount representing investment money valuable article or expenditure is situated or incurred in pakistan or concealed income is pakistan source and in the tax year immediately preceding the tax year in which the investment money valuable article or expenditure is discovered by the commissioner and is situated or incurred outside pakistan and concealed income is foreign source Basically, this ties up with another reform we, uh, reform we discussed yesterday. Uh, this reform says that uh, under Section 111, now, if you do not declare your income and assets, be it domestic or foreign, and they are discovered in any tax year, there is no time bar. Practically, in the taxation laws, uh, in income tax ordinance itself, in most of the areas, there is a time bar of five years. In few cases, it's slightly more and less, but generally it's five years. So now an amendment has been made in section 111 that if there is a discovery of undisclosed income in any tax year, it doesn't matter if it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, you'll still be liable. So that time bar is removed. In subsection four in clause A, after the word channels, the word not exceeding 10 million rupees in a year shall be inserted. So this ties up with the reform I, mentioned in the intro um, basically now you can bring to pakistan uh, amount up to this level without having to pay any tax or disclosing the source in section 114 in subsection 1 clause b in sub clause uh, just bear with me this is something funny happening with the system okay it's fine now sorry about that in uh, subsection in section 114 in subsection 1 in clause b in clause 8 the word or at the end shall be omitted and in sub clause 9 for full stop at the end a semicolon and the word or shall be substituted and thereafter the following new clause shall be added namely every resident person being an individual required to file foreign income and asset statement under section 116 so section 114 has been amended to this extent that now every resident person who if they fall within the categories required to file are now required to actually file foreign income and asset statement under section 116a so this basically addresses the uh, objection that was raised by one of the participants that the politically exposed person are excluded from the periphery of this amnesty and i told you that the insertions have been made there are existing laws as well which require them to file these statements the question is not about the law not being there the question is about actually enforcing the law and making sure this happens 
So in subsection two, in clause D, the word and at the end will be omitted in clause E, full stop and semicolon. Okay, these are just semantics. Uh, let's go to some substance. The clause that shall be added will be, shall be accompanied with a foreign income and asset statement as required under section 116A. So again, even within the amnesty, as you have seen in the forms, the declaration form A and B, you have to give the detailed listing of the assets that you are declaring. In subsection five in the proviso for full stop at the end, a column shall be submitted. And thereafter, the second following second proviso shall be added. Proviso is basically another provision that you are adding uh, clause provided further that the time limitation provided under this section shall not apply if the commissioner is satisfied on the basis of reasons to be recorded in writing that a person who failed to furnish his return as foreign income or on foreign assets. This is another amendment made for the same reform. Basically, when you make a reform, there are different laws that are being impacted and you have to amend all of them accordingly. This is what we already discussed with the this. Uh, section 116A and uh, requiring you to file the return and amendment in 114 requiring you to ensure uh, that you file the return because if you don't declare your assets, even if they are foreign assets or domestic assets, and if they are discovered at any point of time, uh, you can't claim a time bar. You can't say they were older than five years. You would still have to pay the due taxes. You would even be penalized. You may even have to face uh, imprisonment in the worst case, especially if it becomes a case of tax fraud. So it's better to comply. Just try to educate your clients. After section 116, the new section 116A will be inserted, namely as follows. So this is the new section that has been inserted via Income Tax Amendment Ordinance 2018, Foreign Income and Asset Statement. Every resident taxpayer being an individual, now focus every resident taxpayer, being an individual having foreign income equal to or in excess of 10,000 US dollars or having foreign assets with a value of 100,000 US dollars or more shall furnish a statement here and after referred to as the foreign income and asset statement in the prescribed form and verified in the prescribed manner, giving the following particulars. So if you are a taxpayer resident in Pakistan and you have a foreign income of $10,000 or more or foreign assets of $100,000 or more, you have to file this return outlining what these things. Total foreign assets and liabilities on last day of the tax year, any foreign assets transferred by you to any other person during the tax year, and the consideration for any such transfer. The complete particulars of your foreign income, the expenditure derived during the tax year and expenditure wholly and necessarily for the purposes of driving the said income. But do remember, this is only applicable to a taxpayer who is resident in Pakistan and who have ATL above taxable limit with regard to the income, foreign income being $10,000 and foreign asset being $100,000 or more. The commissioner may by a notice in writing require any person being an individual who in the opinion of the commissioner on the basis of reasons to be recorded in writing was required to furnish a foreign income and asset statement under section one, but who has failed to do so to furnish the foreign income and asset statement on the date specified in the notice. So can't evade this. Uh, commissioner can ask you, can discover any time, no time bar, all the penalties would be applicable. In section 118, in subsection one, again, they are semantics word or a comma shall be substituted for word or after figure 116, the expression or a foreign income and asset statement under 116A, if applicable, shall be inserted. These are just insertion to bring the ordinance in line with the newly introduced section. So if you go through the ordinance, it would make sense to you what they mean by replacing comma with or, etc. In subsection 2A, after the figure 116, the expression or a foreign income and asset statement under 116A, if applicable, shall be added. In section 182, in the, in the table, in column one, after serial number 1AA and entries relating there to in columns two, three, and four, the following new serial number and entries relating thereto shall be inserted, namely, 
So this is a new entry in section 182 in the table in column one, one triple A, where any person fails to furnish a foreign asset and the income statement within the due date, such person shall pay a penalty of 2% of the foreign income or value of the foreign assets for each year of default. And this is with regard to section 116A. So basically a penalty has been introduced for the case where you fail to furnish this return. And let me tell you, it's quite high. 2% of the undeclared income or the value of foreign asset each year in default. In schedule one, in part one for division one, the following shall be substituted. Rates of taxes for individual. Uh, this is with regard to the reform regarding the uh, tax slabs for individuals that we discussed yesterday. And I promise you, I'll share today. Here you have. Uh, well, congratulations. Instead of four lakh now, you have 12 lakh income which you can enjoy tax free. So the new BTL uh, below taxable limit would be 1.2 million. Um, welcome, Junit. Junit, can you uh, mute yourself so uh, we can unmute you when the question and answer session begins? Thank you. So the first uh, BTL limit has been increased to 1.2 million. So up to one lakh monthly, you would now don't have, you wouldn't need to pay any taxes now. If your income is between 1.2 to 2.4 million per annum, so this would convert to one to two lakh per month, you have to pay 5% of the amount exceeding 12 lakh. Where the taxable amount exceeds 2.0 million but does not exceed 4.8 million, you have to only pay 60,000 and 10% of the amount exceeding 24 million. So if your income is like 48, 4.8 million, you are earning 4 lakh per month or 48 lakh per annum. You only have to pay 10% of 2.4 million. So that would come up to your 2 lakh 40,000 and 60,000. So you'll only need to pay 3 lakh on 48 lakh income. Do the maths, very attractive. Where the taxable income exceeds 4.8 million rupees, you have to pay a flat 1 lakh 80,000, 180,000 rupees, and 15% of the amount exceeding 48 million. Uh, we have Junaid who has joined us. Yeah. Then we also have the rates of tax for association of persons, which have been revised as well. Uh, taxable BTL is still the same for AOP. Unfortunately for you guys, it's not 1.2 million. It would still remain 400,000. For the others, you have this table, you have this ordinance. Uh, do keep it handy. It would be very helpful for you. Provided that in the case of an association of persons that is a professional firm prohibited from incorporating by any law or the rules of the body regulating their profession, the 35% rate of tax mentioned against serial number eight of the table shall be 32% for tax year 2016 and onwards. So if you are a professional firm uh, where the regulatory body has prohibited you that you can't incorporate yourself, then if you are earning more than 6 million per annum, your rate of tax would be a flat 13, 19, 500 rupees plus 32% for amount exceeding rupees 6 million. Um, and that would be applicable for tax year 2016 and onwards. Where the taxable income in a tax year other than income on which the deduction of tax is final does not exceed 1 million rupees of a person holding a NABZA, basically CNIC, or a taxpayer of the age of not less than 60 years on the first day of that tax year, the tax liability on such income shall be reduced to 50%. So for a senior citizen where the taxable income uh, other than the FTR, final tax regime income, does not exceed 1 million rupee, your tax liability would be reduced by 50%. So that's the end of the income tax amendment ordinance. And we are near the end of the session for today. So if you have any questions, please shoot them. And meanwhile, I would like to welcome 
uh, Junaid Abbas, another of our fellow member, who is also a member of our taxation committee, uh, which I'm privileged to be heading. And Junaid has worked with us on the taxation proposals and in the committee. Uh, welcome, Junaid. Thank you for taking time out today. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear and thank you very much. You are most welcome. Uh, so let's begin with uh, questions, Junaid. We have some questions coming for you uh, regarding the amnesty scheme. So first of all, we have Mr. Johri Lal asking, under section 114, classes of insurance surveying covered not taxable person. Uh, it's not very coherent, Johari. Could you please reset and rephrase what you are trying to ask? Uh, Ijaz Mazur is asking, yes, Mesab got the reference of disclosing of foreign asset income. Okay, that's a comment. Uh, Muhammad Ali Shivani is asking, what about the tax that has already been deducted from the salary of a person that lies now in the 0% bracket, that is 1.2 million? Junaid. Yeah, I would say the new rates will be applicable for the upcoming tax year. So definitely the employers will be de deducting tax accordingly. So you won't have to worry uh, about this aspect. And uh, I think we should just clarify here that uh, the new rate and this amendment ordinance specifically pertaining to the rates would be applicable from July 1, 2018 onwards. And yeah, we have uh, clarified that and Junaid has I answered mean, that rightly. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, th I thought I would would ju we'll just uh, retaliate that fact. Maybe uh, someone missed out there. Sure, sure. Uh, okay. Um, there are two parts of the reform package and the amnesty. Um, there are four ordinances that have been promulgated to ensure the amnesty and some of the reforms are enacted. The amnesty has been enacted from 10th of April 2018 and is effective till 30th of April 2018. However, the taxation reforms, most of them, including the new salary rates, would be upcoming from the new tax year beginning 1st of July 2018, which basically means, Shabazz, that just like Junaid said, you don't have to worry about this because your previous income was rightly taxed and your new income would be taxed on the new rates. Uh, next one is uh, Shabazz Mahdum. So the categorization of salaried and non salaried has now been abolished. Chamit. Sorry, what's the question? Uh, Mr. Shabazz is asking whether the categorization of salaried and non salaried has been abolished. No, no, the categorization is still there. I mean, it, has, it hasn't been abolished. True. Next, Jory Lal is asking, uh, I understand tax slab for salaried is not correct. For example, if you calculate 10% on 2.4 million, it would be 240K plus 60K according to earlier slab. And the aggregate amount would be 300K. Instead, rupees 180K, which is mentioned in this slab. Uh, Jory, this is the new slab. This is the new that one uh, which has been announced by the PM, and this would be applicable from 1st of July. Usman Yusuf is asking revised rates will be applicable to both salaried and business individual. Junaid sir, uh, Usman the, sir is the, asking you whether these revised rates are applicable to both individuals and business individuals. Yeah, they have been revised for both. Salaried and business, both are covered. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mohammed Hamza is saying, is there any chance that before start of the next year, the new tax slab is aborted? Uh, I mean, you could comment better on that. But of course, I think we'll have to pass through parliament. That's what I believe. So there could be few changes. But what I have heard uh, from from uh, from my community that this won't be changed and this will be approved the way it is. Great. Uh, there are two aspects to this. One is the legal, and the other is practical. Uh, yeah. Legally, that has to go to Parliament, as you have to mention. Uh, you have mentioned or to an ordinance. So the new incumbent government at the earliest can take office at the end of August or September or somewhere in August. 
So the rates would be enacted from 1st of July. So practically, it's highly unlikely that it can be abolished before that. And even going forward, such a move uh, to be reversed can have certain implications. So yes, I agree with you, Junaid. Uh, very less likely uh, in terms of both legal procedures and the practicality that this can be abolished before next tax year. Uh, next question is from Ahmed Jahangir. 1.2 million exemption limit is also for businesses. Ahmed, I think Junaid already answered that, that yes, this is for business individuals, not all businesses. So like if you are companies, uh, you are corporate entity or AOP, no, this is not applicable to you. If you are a sole proprietor, yeah. Shabazz Magdoum is asking, but it says tax ref rates for individuals and another table for AOP. There is nothing classifying them between sell rate and non sell rate. For you, Junaid. Uh, maybe uh, you, you just uh, a bit clarification for them. So the rate would be applicable as you just mentioned a few seconds ago uh, that the specific segregation is about corporate or businesses running in the form of AOPs and all other individuals whether they are salaried or they are not salaried uh, they have been given the leverage of the new, the new, the new applicable tax. True. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Jari Lal who is saying this amount is calculated on new slab. Please check the one in the slab of the income tax amendment ordinance 2018. Okay, sure. We'll do that, Jory, if we have a time at the end of the session, or I'll be sharing my contact detail. You can feel free to shoot me an email and I'll definitely get back to you. Essen Iqbal is asking, wow, quite a name. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to come. <laughs> Uh, great. Uh, do you still need to declare your foreign income, which has been declared abroad, but is not taxable as it is below the annual taxable threshold? Junaid, sir. I think I should comment. Oh, you should comment on that. I mean, you okay. better in a better position. Essence of, uh, we just read about section 116A. Uh, there are two things, whether you are claiming this amnesty or not. If you are claiming this amnesty, you have to declare all. If you are not claiming this amnesty, even otherwise going forward, Section 116A has been inserted in the Income Tax Ordinance, which now required that if you are a resident taxpayer in Pakistan. So the first question would be whether this income is while you have been non-resident or you are resident working here for some foreign company. If you are resident and your taxable income is $10,000 or more, then yes, you need to declare even if you are resident and your taxable income is less than $10,000, but your undeclared foreign assets are more than $100,000, you would need to make a declaration. If not, there are severe penalties and there's no time bar with regard to that. Okay, Asan Iqbal Saab is resident in Pakistan. Uh, where are you based, Asan Saab, in Islamabad? <laughs> Somewhere near the constitution every day. <laughs> On a lighter note, no. Our Essence Saab is based in Lahore. Okay, uh, let's move on. Next question is, Muhammad Ali Shewani, will the public office holders have to disclose their assets under 116A? Junaid? Yeah, of course, the, the disclosure is required. I mean, but uh, the exemption and all that stuff has been specifically mentioned that those who, uh, those who hold a public office, uh, this isn't applicable, especially the amnesty scheme. I'm, I'm not sure if he's asking about that thing. Uh, that amnesty scheme is not applicable for those public office holders, but other than that, yeah, regarding disclosures, etc., they would have to disclose them. True. So, uh, very rightly said, yes, 116A doesn't make any difference between PPs, politically exposed persons, and or not. So, under 116A, if you uh, are above ATL, above the taxable limit, you have to file, you have to disclose. Doesn't matter if you are a politically exposed person. But yeah, if you are talking about amnesty, then uh, section 116A is irrelevant under amnesty. You have to declare if you are availing, if you are a politically exposed person, legally you can't avail and can't declare. But come the next tax return season, you would have to declare. So next, Usman Yusuf, kindly differentiate between an act, an ordinance and the rules. Thanks. Would you like to answer that, Junaid? Yeah, the, the ordinance has to be passed by the parliament and after the approval of parliament, it becomes an act. 
till approval from the uh, till approval of ordinance uh, from the parliament it isn't called an act and it cannot be enacted so there's some major differentiation regarding approval from parliament and, and you can maybe right. extend that yeah you can extend right. right what about rules 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 are uh, made by the secondary bodies like for example uh, rules in income tax rules are made by the federal board of revenue yeah federal board of revenue so mm -hmm. act is passed by the parliament and then income tax rules are promulgated by the federal board of revenue in coordination with all other relevant entities like some some maybe some with only agents have been authorized by the so very well done. well done i would just add to here that basically act and ordinance tell you what the law is and rules are the practicalities how would that happen for example you have to file a return how would you file that you have to pay the penalty how would you pay that so the law is enshrined in the ordinance or the act and how you would actually practically do that is detailed in the rules um, let's move on to the next question it's by muhammad hamza if an individual is not resident and does not apply for amnesty uh, wants to become filer but wants to become filer what will be the procedure also will there be any penalty for late filing junaid yeah there will be penalties i mean jo uh, relevant penalties will be levied uh, but is he asking for becoming filer yeah he's saying uh, that if someone is non resident and yeah. they don't even want to avail the amnesty as of now uh, what is the process for them to become filer and when they, they file the return would they have to pay any uh, penalty for late filing anything like that yeah they, they'll definitely have to file their returns if they want to become filer and uh, and whatever like like when when whenever they file the returns and sbr's active tax list is updated like it's updated every sunday so after that update their name is included uh, in the filer list great um very well said perhaps you'll also like to expand on this point that if they are registering for the ntn for the first time yeah. then in the first time they would not have to pay any late filing penalty however if they were registered for nta with ntn before and there was a gap and they were not filing returns then legally fpr has the option to impose the penalty but practically if they have not issued a notice and you are complying and filing return then the practical standard has been that you are not issued a penalty notice unless there comes a gap in your compliance thank you so that will move on to the next question by shokat siddiqui sir i'm a non resident may i need to submit income tax return and wealth statement i have no income in pakistan junaid sir uh if you are not resident you are of course not uh, required to do so but uh, some people still prefer to do so just because they have some kind of some some transaction in pakistan and and it, it is being heard that in the coming budget there will be more uh, benefits for becoming a filer and there there would be certain kind of transactions where only filers would be uh, allowed to do that stuff so it would be better if we all do return filing and there is no harm in filing a return even if you are non resident because you have some uh, practical ties to the country and and you were born in pakistan and you are a pakistani uh, but of course yeah if you are if from legal aspect if you are a non resident uh, uh, we are losing your voice junaid can you get the mic closer to your mouth uh, hello can you hear me now yeah perfect now okay, okay great uh so very well answered uh, another point which i'd like to add is that uh, perhaps you'll also need to see whether you have some property based in pakistan or not and depending on that you should be able to reach a more practical decision with regard to your own circumstances as junaid has shared uh, there has been a continued trend of developing filer versus non filer uh, which is expected to continue great session keep it up acc pakistan Uh, Samiullah, thank you. Uh, Muhammad Osman, how wealth statement filed in previous years will reflect the changes made under the amnesty scheme? 
they will not usman you are not required to revise your previously filed well statement mohammad hamza thank you mohammad hamza uh, just confirm at this time i only have to file one year tax return or two year return for becoming a filer in continuation with my previous question jane uh, same guy who asked uh, about not availing the amnesty and becoming filer so he's saying whether i need to file just for one year or two year to get in the atl yeah he he have to file the last year tax return or at least and if, if he did have some operations in the year prior to that it's better to file a return for that year too great so the answer is hamza saab that uh, you'll only need to file for one year to get in the active tax payer list but if you have any operations any income related or any other activities in the country it's better to file for the year before ali informative session shaukat saab thank you uh, thank you guys we still have a few minutes hamza saab okay thank you uh, okay we have another question we have a few minutes so if you have some questions uh, make use of the time johri lal could you please uh, could you guide how to get refund check which a person has already claimed but even after holy no, no, no. didn't get the refund check today how would you get refund check from fpr <laughs> i would first of all start praying and the second step would be yeah, like keep trying and maybe of course uh, there will be a day when government will issue refund okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was on a, on a lighter mood yeah okay uh, junaid is uh, on a lighter mood uh, he has said keep praying there would come a day you will get the refund i would suggest jory um, junaid is right it's very challenging to get the refund but it's not impossible however it varies case to case whether you're talking about an individual a corporate entity what is the volume what is the section all these things uh, if properly pursued there are certain ways you can still get the refunds so if you are interested about your specific case um, as i promised i'll be sharing my contact details in a while feel free to send your query and inshallah i'll try to get back to you as soon as possible ijaz mazhar is thanking everyone thank you acca team for these sessions and uh, i think we are done with the questions i'll just wait for a few seconds if somebody has any more questions we actually also have another honorable member of our taxation committee joining us mirza fasiuddin beg sahab uh, so if you guys have any question we can ask him to um uh, fasi you came very late we have literally answered dozens and dozens of questions yeah mortaza barucha thanks mohammad iqbal without paying speed money you can get your funds uh mohammad iqbal you may be very surprised but let me tell you this even without paying speed money you can get your funds uh murtaza barucha thanks um uh, very informative okay any other okay we have a question from mohammad ali uh junaid if you could mute yourself and let us uh, have fasi saab answer this question so that yeah, he can me, also yeah. participate in the session and thank you very much for your contributions fasi saab if you can unmute your mic please but also please move to a quieter room <laughs> okay <laughs> um are you there fasi saab ab unmute he self mute Okay, the question is by Muhammad Iqbal Saab. Uh, oh no, that was done by Muhammad Ali Shivani. If you have done an irrelevant question, please, how can someone be a member of ACC Tax Community? Okay, that's something that you can answer. Okay, sure, sure. How can someone be a member of ACC Tax Community? Okay, the term we referred to was ACC Tax Committee. 
you are all member of acca text community being acca professionals how to become a part of acca taxation committee is if you do have a good profile you have been working in the field you are experienced from time to time we invite expression of interest uh, in fact uh, one is planned for the next week as well so you can respond to that and then acca reaches out to you uh, and hopefully you can spare some time and contribute it is basically voluntary work all these members take time out of their personal schedule to serve the whole fraternity so uh, look out for the email next week respond if you want to be a part of it and we would love to have you on board next one is by usman yusuf uh, under which head of income tax online chalan for amnesty scheme will be generated? I think Fasi Saab is not available, so let's ask this from Yavar. Yavar, can you unmute your mic, please? Yes, you, sir. Hello. Uh, Yavar, we have a question for you. Usman Yusuf yeah. Saab is asking under which head of income tax online chalan for amnesty scheme will be generated? I believe he is trying to ask that when you generate the each alarm, which head would you select? Uh, I think uh, uh, that we have not created an online chalan ko create nahi kiya. Hopefully, we have option present that when we make each alarm, there are options that you have to pay with the return, you have to pay with the withholding. Ka pay karna hai. So hopefully, we will option insert that option or we will do it in the system. Ke indar, I think so. If you can answer this question. Sure, better. sure. Uh, um, thank you, Yavar. Very, very well answered. In this case, you have two options. When you have specific option not available, when you have introduced it, you can always select this being a tax, income tax. You can either go for income tax or the option of others. I would advise income tax till the time it's inserted. Uh, we were told that it would be inserted by today. So hopefully it would be by now. If not, and you want to do it quickly, although you still have time, then you can straight away select income tax because this is income tax that you are paying along uh, with this amnesty. And you simply attach that chalan uh, with your application form while filing it through FPR's portal. Um, okay, Muhammad Iqbal says, uh, it's a surprise for me. I know Iqbal sir, uh, people can get refund by speed money is a surprise for many, but it still happens. Uh, we are full of surprises. Muhammad Usman Ali is thanking, Ali Saab is thanking uh, uh, Yuyawar for the answer. And uh, I guess that's the end of the session. So um, with this, as promised, you have the contact details on your screens. Feel free to send an email. You have any specific query, you want to get in touch. If you send a WhatsApp message or an SMS, Please do introduce yourself and mention you attended this session. I'll uh, then get back to you as soon as possible. And now before handing over to our regional head of member affairs, Arun Jan Saab, I would like to thank all our panelists today, Junaid, uh, Fasi, Yawar, Munir, who spared time out of their busy schedule on a working day and uh, became a part of this so all of you can benefit. And thanks to ACCA, which has been the first professional body to um, conduct the sessions, CPD sessions on these very timely topics to set the trend and the bar high for the members. And we hope these have been beneficial for you. And keep coming, your, uh, keep uh, updating us with your comments about the sessions you like to see. Thank you very much for sparing the time. And I'll now pass on this to Arun sir. Yes, thank you very much. And and to begin with, I'd like to appreciate the entire taxation subcommittee that was working under uh, the, the kind leadership of Omar Zaheef. I think the subcommittee has done a phenomenal job, uh, not just preparing the, the budget proposal, uh, which we are actively now, uh, ACCA Pakistan's budget proposal, which we are actively promoting uh, to all the relevant individuals. It has been shared with all the ACCA members who are active, uh, around 5,500 individuals. It has been sent to most of the CFOs in Pakistan and almost all the regulators, around 1,500 such individuals. So yes, that has been done and that's, um, I mean, the credit of that purely goes to the taxation subcommittee. Um, I would also like to uh, you know, share with all of you that the interest in local taxation 
Um, I mean, this, uh, when we used to discuss ACCA, the, the qualities of ACCA members indoors within the ACCA circle, we always used to say that ACCA members need to have better grip over the local taxation. And, and let me share with you that uh, Omar as an individual and all the subcommittee members and Yawar also, they've done a phenomenal job in, in, in raising the bar of the taxation knowledge within ACCA members across Pakistan. And that once again is a very, very commendable job. And we are actively going out now promoting our members as tax experts to the regulators, to the ministry, to, to and, and to various other forums. So that's very important. You might like now, to mention about uh, Mr. Saab's. Uh... Yes, yes. And, and um, you know, Omar uh, had the honor of meeting the finance minister only earlier in the week on Monday. Representing ACCA. Presenting yes. ACCA's budget. Yes, as the, as a representing ACCA and, you know, carrying the ACCA budget proposal with him. And uh, Mehta Sahab was uh, so impressed with the work that uh, the subcommittee had done and, and Omar had done that he'd invited ACCA and the representative of the taxation subcommittee to his office for a one-on-one -on -one conversation around the upcoming budget. So I think that's a big success. And, and I think there are going to be many more successes like this going forward. Uh, in our previous meeting with the state minister for finance, um, ACCA has pitched that we would want to be on various uh, think tanks around taxation uh, in Pakistan and uh, this proposal of ours has readily been accepted and we will hopefully be invited to many other active tax forums going forward. Now with the government change I think we'll have to press a reset button once again. Uh, if the same government comes back we'll continue. If the government changes We'll have to, you know, maybe kickstart a bit, but uh, I think the, the foundation has already been laid. One very important announcement, and since there are quite a few ACCA members sitting here uh, with the taxation interest, we had successfully created a LinkedIn page for tax advisory, uh, I think around four months ago. Now, and, and all these um, talented, brilliant tax professionals who, who the part of the taxation subcommittee are already a member of that LinkedIn page. Now, all we had to do was to openly announce this page to all the members to join in and, you know, regularly on a routine basis, ask questions, ask for advice, uh, consult each other, share opinions, share the latest uh, developments around the taxation field. So I think that is going to be a very, very interesting uh, move. And um, I think outside of the UK, Pakistan, in Pakistan, this is going to be the first, uh, I mean, within the ACCA community, it's going to be the first such forum, which is going to help its members to, uh, you know, to get advice on important tax matters. So I think in the time to come and hopefully within the next week we will be able to announce that linkedin group and we would love if you can if all of these members who have an interest in taxation could join in and just regularly be in contact with our taxation experts so that was all i had to uh, just share with you can you please come here yeah. <laughs> all right okay Uh, in the end, before Arun Saab says goodbye, on behalf of all the ACCA members, we would like to thank you for your phenomenal work and the support. This wouldn't have been possible without you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank thank you very much. Excellent work. And I think this is an excellent idea as well that they brought in the entire subcommittee to talk to the membership base. Thank you to all other taxation subcommittee members as well for your time and for your effort. I think this work is exemplary. and. Uh, from this point onwards, we go step by step towards, you know, making ACCA members more tax savvy. Yes, tax right. savvy, not tax savvy, tax savvy <laughs> also. <laughs> True. Uh, Great. Thank you very much. And uh, that's all from here. Please share your feedback with us about this session, about yesterday's session. And last announcement, we will be sharing your certificates with you, hopefully by tomorrow, the handouts you would have downloaded and certificates 
either tomorrow or early next week you will receive them in your email thank you so very much for your interest and take care of yourself have a nice week